Welcome to Hand Stamp. Uh, my name is Josh Coyne and I'm making it a habit of mine to dive into the live music experience and the memories that come with it. Uh, today I'm joined by Peter and David Bruis of genre-challenging Sunderland outfit Field Music. How are you fellas? Not too bad. Yeah, Thank you. fair Thank you very- to middling. <laughs> Fair to Midland. Thank you very much for joining. Um, Peter, where are, you, where are you connecting from? Um, the um, capital city of Wearside, uh, Sunderland. What about you, David? Uh, I am also in Sunderland. I'm at home. I'm keeping one eye on two slightly mischievous children. Okay, so you guys live in the in the same city at this point, same place. I think at one point you lived in different towns. Am I right? Uh, yeah, I, I lived in Newcastle for a bit, okay. but you've returned. You've seen the light. Is that right? Um, seen the price. Yeah, I've seen the price. Yeah, uh, and it's it's really not very far away. So it's all it's all the same to me. <laughs> okay, it's all northeast. Um, yeah. So, how have you guys been navigating through all of this madness? I know that's the kind of um, go-to question to start an interview off with uh, nowadays. But um, in terms of um, creating music, planning things going forward in your actual career, how are you guys finding it? I'll go with David first. Um, I mean, like everyone else, we had a period where we were stuck in the house. Fortunately, we. we we had started some recordings at our studio just before lockdown. So we had kind of material to take home and work on. And then gradually we started to be able to get into the studio a little bit more. Um, and we, we've said yes to a lot of things because, you know, we were probably a little bit worried that uh, financially things were going to be incredibly difficult over this period. So we've ended up with quite a lot of stuff on. Mm-hmm. Um, but not in a not in a terrible way, and you know, like everyone else, we we are just negotiating it, moving all of our plans to next year, juggling childcare responsibilities. <laughs> Peter, is it around about the same for you? Um, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I suppose we're <clears throat> lucky in that. We have our own studio. Uh, well, we have our own rooms with microphones in them, which is the same sort of thing. Um, and we've managed to stay, I mean, yeah, like really busy, actually. Um, I mean, it was a shame not to do, I mean, we had a few festivals booked in, um, so that was a shame not to do them. And it's, it's kind of a shame not to, play with the band all the time you know I suppose because me and Dave we tend to see the recording side of things and the live side of things kind of as separate separate sort of things really Um, so yeah I've kind of missed playing with the band Cool And, and speaking of which I believe you guys had a live stream that has had to be rescheduled recently um, how have you found, found the challenge um, of adjusting to presenting music in a new way? A lot of people have obviously, you know, they're just starting to maybe cotton on at this point with the state of the live music industry, uh, that they do need to find new ways and adapt. Um, it seems as though with the, with the live stream you guys had planned and things like that, then um, you were kind of ahead of the curve in that sense because you were kind of forward thinking. Um, how have you guys found that part of it? I mean, it, it felt actually that, that we were kind of, I feel like we're behind the curve a bit anyway, but, but I think what we, want, what we wanted to do, what we were keen to do is if we're going to do it, we have to make it something which is like televisual. We're not going to recreate a live experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're fortunate that, that some of our close friends have some skills in that area. Unfortunately, they have so many skills in that area. They also have uh, real jobs in mm-hmm. that area, which is why we thought we to schedule it. Um, and it's, uh, it is a challenge. I mean, I think that if we hadn't had this particular record to kind of uh, close out, 
because we we did an album that came out the beginning of this year which kind of has to be performed in one piece um we might not have even tried to do a live stream thing it just so happened that it seemed like a good solution um for us to like wrap up everything around this particular record um and yeah we're we're hoping that it's going to be like a kind of like special televisual experience rather than like a, a recreated live experience excellent and and i'm yeah. sure that many people are looking forward to that you know including myself um this is this piece that you're referring to is uh, making a new world uh, i believe uh, how many people have brought up the fact that that's uh, become kind of accidentally on the nose with the current situation not as many as i thought but the the the, <laughs> the, the tune about the tune about the influenza pandemic um is instrumental so that there's less less people can chat about <laughs> mm. yeah so that, that that for me was like uh you know some things just kind of hit home accidentally lyrically don't they and it's uh it's a nice happy accident um peter as the older brother the focus of this is that um i like to talk to people about their live music memories uh from an audience point of view okay so, I like to connect with artists about the kind of shows that maybe hit home for them. Um, I assume that it was yourself that maybe first developed a relationship with live music or, or music in general at a young age. Is that right? Um, I, I'm not sure, really. I feel like we did it together, really. Maybe I was either late or you were early, Dave, but I feel that our initial live music experiences were probably like, the same like, yeah they were like family things you know I, yeah I, I i can't think of anything before going to see jethro tull at the city hall in <laughs> 1992 is that is that right uh yeah i think 91 92 um so i think that might have been the first sort of big proper gig that we went to was um jethro tull with uh, and their standing drummer was dave maddox did you know that, Dave? I I remember. I mean, because it was our first like live experience, so I remember getting the program and like pouring through it. And it's like, oh, they've got extra pages in because this Dave Maddox and Dave Peg are playing drums with them. I wonder who they are. <laughs> and then I forgot who they were, and then uh, we happened to meet Dave Maddox years and years later. But uh, but anyway, yeah. So that was the first. Um, show we went to, and I think, uh, and I, and I feel like we were a, we were on a sort of live music parallel for probably quite a while. Okay, and when you went to this Jeffro Tool show, you said that you got the program. Did you get a T-shirt as well? I felt like everyone got a T-shirt for at least their first four or five shows. I don't think we did for that one. No, but I, but but like the next things we we went to, I, I'm pretty sure we did. Like. There's a bit of like flailing around when when you you, you start going to see shows and you're not... we we were interested in playing much more than we were interested in listening to music. So it, the <laughs> first shows it's like yeah Jethro Tull, Joe Satriani, uh, I got the t-shirt for that. Yeah, Jamiroquai. I got, I got a Joe Satriani t-shirt. Those those are the ones we've got t-shirts for. But the first the, one where it's like, I actually really like this band it was probably the Black Crows, and that is in 1995. I know because I've checked. And I got a, t a Black Crows t-shirt that one of the gigs that we went to, I think it was Manchester, and it was a, a green t-shirt with a crow smoking a huge bifter. <laughs> and I think my mum just hid that t-shirt so I, <laughs> I couldn't wear it for school or anything you know <laughs> and you never found but, it no i don't know where it is no That's but some, somebody somewhere or the bin has got my um green black crows t-shirt with a, a sunglassed sunglassed uh, sort of crow smoking a smoking a doobie with a top hat on so it seems we've momentarily lost david to um parenthood but um, were you guys playing Family music college. before you started to see live shows then? It seems that that might have been the case because you were going to these high-level musicians live and that obviously comes with appreciation of playing itself. 
we yeah we we were we were playing in you know like in covers bands mm. from about 1994 um and our experience of live music outside these like huge city hall i don't know it's like 3000 capacity or something outside of that was just going to see other bands play covers of deep purple songs in in pubs um but prior to that, we had no experience of live music. You know, I think it was Top of the Pops. Um, we might watch um, Jules Holland, but I suppose because we were we were just kids, you know, 11, 12-year-old or whatever we were when we first started playing, it was more about the guitar magazines or the drum magazines and... Um, learning to to play. I don't. I don't. I don't know what I had in my mind. What I was t- attempting to do. I think you know, the first band that I liked was um, was the Bangles. You know, I saw the Bangles on top of the Pops, and they had a singing drummer. And I thought, yeah, I want to do that. But I, I didn't really even realize it wasn't live. Yeah. Well, I didn't even think about it. It was a good era for like bands' videos being fake live. It gave you an unrealistic. Yeah impression that you thought was realistic of what being in a band was about like bon yeah like, like, the Gun- or whatever. like Guns N' Roses videos you know it, it, the Guns N' Roses videos were like them playing live to thousands of people I thought that like, you just got in a band and that's what you ended up doing yeah uh, well, the that, Paradise City yeah, video done that. yeah uh, yeah the Paradise City video yeah you join the band get, white leather jacket, the screen, get on stage yeah. Wembley Stadium straight away. That's yeah. that's your second gig. That's it. So you guys yeah. said that you were watching Top of the Pops and things like that, uh, and obviously a lot of um, you know amidst kind of a um, your artistic approach, there is obviously a lot of um, pop music sensibilities within your songs. Um, what are the kind of some of the artists maybe that hit home when you were watching Top of the Pops growing up? Some of the people that really kind of fostered your love of music and, um, and and that genre in specifically? I mean, it depends on how far you want to go back. Because, I mean, I was, I was watching I Top of the Pops with Shake and Stevens, you know, and um, Soft Cell. I was, like, totally entranced. But I think that was, like, as a kid. Yeah, like, but, up, up until, like, 1993 or whatever, when we actually started playing in the pubs. I just didn't filter it at all. And when like all top of the pops had been replaying on BBC four or whatever, we just watch it and here like, we didn't see there being any difference at all between S express and transvision vamp and hollow notes or like late queen. It just, it was all just one thing. And, and in a way, that, that, that was always the beauty of Top of the Pops, that it didn't really differentiate between those things. You'd have, like, the Lemonheads come on and play, and it's like, this sounds a bit strange. But you didn't interrogate it in that way. You just accepted that Top of the Pops included all of these. Oh, okay. oh some, somebody likes this. Yeah. It's not singing properly. <laughs> yeah. I, and and did you find that that actually that comes full circle because certainly with you guys the way you approach music it feels as though you at that young age music is music and then you almost as a rite of passage have to become a bit of an asshole about music and then it comes back around to the point where your appreciation across you know all the genres really is you become less of a purist sometimes well hopefully Otherwise, you kind of put yourself into a corner, certainly as a musician. Do you agree? Yeah, to a certain extent. I think you just become a different kind of purist. Um, you know, you, you're not ashamed of all the things that you liked about the Stock Aitken and Waterman records, and there are things you don't like about them. You know, it's, I don't really like Jason Donovan's voice, but I tell mm-hmm. you what, that chorus just takes off in Too Many Broken Hearts. It just takes yeah. off. It's amazing. But I don't want to really listen to it, but it's like, I think, feel I can appreciate it. There, there, there is a bit of a, a theme of like 
of the field music's career from when we were recording the first album, like from the end of 2003, of like gradually becoming less embarrassed about the things from our youth, which we there is something about it that we like, whether that's Doc Aitken or Mortimer, I was just thinking, you know, I don't think I'd want to be friends with Lenny Kravitz, but that is a great riff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm just going to, I'm just going to, except that part of me thinks that's a great riff and, and I'm, I'm fine with that yeah and you, you know what really helps in terms of kind of validation from your taste and your approach to music and your ability as a songwriter is an endorsement from prince is that is that fair to say peter um well i never really saw the tweet so i, I still kind of feel it didn't happen i made that tweet up it's just i just manipulated it on my I knew it I knew it. Or whatever, whatever. I, I did it on Deluxe Paint, and now you just have to pretend that it's real. Wonderful. It seems like a touchstone right. in, a field, in a field music interview that I need to at least mention the Prince endorsement. Um, when you guys eventually maybe started to see local live music, what were your options in Sunderland? Um, there was, well, let's think of the venues. Um, initially it was going to see kind of blues rock bands I imagine I remember going to see The Force at McCann's it was just a pub like an Irish pub and they had a stage and The Force were kind of um, like a twin guitar sort of band they were kind of somewhere between Iron Maiden and like Thin Lizzy uh, but they were like really I th they probably still are like a really popular local band I'm, I'm, I, I'm assuming this, that they're still around because they had quite a big you know big following for a band and I, I remember being like totally amazed by them I thought these guys are like a stadium band and they're playing so loud in a pub in front of 60 people it was mad and I got in for free you know you just get it you just go in and it was free um so I suppose that was kind of a um, bit of a bit of an eye opener after the uh, Paradise City video. <laughs> so that was kind of like one side of it, and then there was the because we wanted to play, we um, and I think it was through a da my dad's friend, who was in a band called the Rhythm Bandits, uh, Jerry. Um, uh, he was in a band called the Rhythm Bandits, who I tried to join this band on drums, but I wasn't good enough and I wasn't fast enough because they would play. And you uh, had to go to like, school, Peter. And we had to go to school the next day, but it was, they played sort of like maximum hard R&B, like Dr. Feelgood songs, twice as fast as Dr. Feelgood. And uh, they became quite a bit, a bit of an inspiration for me. They were, um, they played hard, they played fast, and they were just, even though they were older than us by between, <laughs> between sort of 20 and 15, well, maybe even more than that, actually, um, they were cool. They were like cool, and they just didn't give a toss. Like, yeah. Um, and I think seeing a band like that, and that was generally in Gateshead, at a place we used to go to called the Duke of Cumberland. And we ended up going to this, it was like a busker's club. It wasn't a busker's club as such. You'd go and busk the songs, your own songs. You would get up with a band and you'd just be like, right, one, two, three, four, go. Bullfrog and blues. Would, and yeah, so it was kind of, you know, a lot of it was probably not very good, but... It was a good, um, like a testing ground, really. So like an open for, mic night? You've been able to play. An yeah, open mic yeah, night, but yeah. also open guitar, open just join a band and this like canon of blues rock hits, you, you can join in. And yeah, and I think it was good for us to go and watch other people who were better than us by a mile and then have to kind of get on stage with them and make loads of mistakes, flail around. But then, you know, it kind of raised 
you, you, the game and raised your aspirations. You thought, and, well, change aspirations. I went from wanting to be like, oh, I'm going to be in a band and I'm going to play in, in a stadium to I'm going to be in a band. I'm going to play to 30 people like these guys and I'm going to play hard and fast <laughs> and just good, you know. So it just changed how I thought about it. Awesome. I think that sometimes when people are starting to realistically think about playing music live, there is that moment where it's almost like being a, 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 a young person who's playing sport, maybe playing football, and they're scoring loads and loads of goals in their year group, and then they play the year above and they can't get near yeah. the ball. And it's like seeing those bands play where you've been practicing for the last few months and you think you sound shit hot. You think you sound like Paradise City. And then all of a sudden, yeah. you, you know, you're watching these guys and they kind of blow it out of the water, your kind of expectations. Um, David, I spoke to um, Ross of the Future Heads before, and he said that a lot of the time um, it was going to venues maybe in Newcastle, and like you said, in Gateshead. Uh, was that the case for you, for you guys? Were you kind of having to kind of cross borders to, uh, to see some, some certain shows? Well, there's, there's two eras that we're crossing over here. When we were involved in this like covers band, buskers club, pub rock thing, there just weren't any venues in Sunderland where there was only one venue in Sunderland where that's, that stuff happened. And actually a lot of it was like spread out. They weren't necessarily like city center shows. You, you would go and play literally in a village called No Place <laughs> out in County Durham. And then as that finished and we stopped thinking so much about playing and started becoming like listeners and we start to develop our snobbery about music um and make original music in a haphazard way which is probably more what, what ross is that's the era ross is talking about um there there weren't very many established venues in sunderland so the the gigs that you're talking about in sunderland then are back rooms of pubs very DIY, usually pretty terrible, but very like good hearted things. And if you wanted to go and see like something like a real band or a touring band, that very rarely occurred in Sunderland. So yeah, the, the late night train to Newcastle and the expensive taxi back became uh, a regular, regular part of our lives. And who are, some of the, who are some of the shows and some of the acts that you remember from the late night train trips to Newcastle? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, it... You went to see Elastica at the Riverside, remember? And... Oh, yeah, that was, that, I think that was... Did you go to... Yeah. yeah, it wasn't called the Riverside then. It, it, it changed its name to Foundation, maybe? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and there were, there were gigs at... Um, North, uh, Newcastle University and Northumbria University so we went to see Primal Scream and Mercury Rev at, both at Newcastle yeah. University um, Those like NME tours you know I went to a couple of them Yeah you, you went know, to the... see Camp Pike Velocid, didn't you? By accident <laughs> No I actually, I actually enjoyed them <laughs> but, um, Yeah that was, so, that was like, um, with Coldplay, Coldplay by accident Yeah, yeah. yeah I saw Coldplay by accident um, and Shaq and and then I spoke but I mean that that sort of didn't last very long I, I, I think I, me, I remember going to a Primal Scream gig and really not enjoying it right and just and I think it was I realised that even though there were a few hundred people there most of them were just there for the lager and I just thought I don't I don't like this this is an expensive like way it. to drink lager. <laughs> yeah, it's like this is this is silly, and I th I think that's when I kind of started appreciating those sort of DIY shows. It's still touring bands because we had some good promoters in Newcastle and in Sunderland. Um, but it was it was a very DIY, and you would see a touring band, but it might only be anywhere between well up to sort of two hundred and fifty people there. Um, and that's what I really started like, where everyone's in a room and they're all sort of, and it could be only 10 people in a room, but they're focused on what's going on. 
once you get past 500 people capacity, the um, percentage of those people who are f like fully engaged in it as a live music experience really, really goes down. That, that's what I've found. You know, it's like it starts to drop off. You know, mm. there's there's almost a threshold, isn't there, where um, you know these gigantic bands like your Primal Scream or like other examples. I mean, I saw, uh, I remember seeing, I spoke to someone who saw Royal Blood uh, and they saw them twice within the space of a year and one gig experience was complete opposite to the other because they'd got so much radio yeah. airplay uh, and they'd kind of blown up and they'd adopted an audience maybe that were there for the lager. Are there any other examples of bands that you've experienced that with? I mean, I mean, I mean it certainly happened with us with the Flaming Lips, where we went to see them. Yeah, saw them play at Leeds Festival, and I think that was '99. Um, just when the soft bulletin was hitting, and it was a real surprise to everyone. And then, as soon as they toured, we went to see them. Maybe at the Lead Mill in Sheffield. I mean, this is how far we had to travel mm -hmm. for those gigs. Mm -hmm. Then, by the next time we went to see them at the Lead Mill the atmosphere was starting to change. And I saw them maybe three years later in Birmingham. And I, it, was really de it was really depressing because I was surrounded by people who were just talking over the entire thing. And it really did me head in. And I just didn't have, I couldn't get close enough or away from these people enough to have a, a live experience and it's not fair really because like it was almost like look that I had such a transcendent experience the first couple of times I saw them and my expectations for what it was going to do to me was so high and I didn't realize how much of that depended on how it felt with everyone else in the room as well um yeah and it's yeah it's not fair I mean I I, I wish the Flaming Lips all the best and I hope they have a great time playing to loads of people and I hope they make loads of money but you know, I might not go and see them again because I, 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 I know that I'm not going to be able to recreate that like transcendent experience that I had the first time I saw them. They might be the only live option uh, soon because obviously... Yeah, at least they've got the bubbles. They've them and the their bubbles. lizard people audience are going to be... <laughs> because I'm talking to you on the 20th of October and, uh, you know, by the time you're listening to this, it'll be maybe a couple of weeks back. Uh, but yesterday, I believe, or the day before, he did a good tweet, which was a retweet um, of David, David Ike, Ike, a certain I'm David sorry. Ike. What are your thoughts uh, on the tweet and the most depressing thread of replies you'll ever see online? <laughs> I was very, very... So he, he, did, he did a tweet with a, a picture of the Flame and Lips gig, and he obviously didn't know who they were or what it was about, and like said, you know, when insanity becomes normal, freedom is dead, or something like that, you know which he wouldn't say it in that way because he, he didn't, didn't do that kind of dramatic thing. Um, and yeah, it's like, I look at it and say, oh, like, cool, it's that, that thing the Flame Lips have done and, you know, they're kind of taking the mick, but also, oh, mate, I have my own live music experience in here with <laughs> child with crash symbols wandering around. Um, <laughs> where, where was I? Uh, yeah, the, They've done it so everyone's in a bubble and it's fun and it's ironic and it's they're doing something with what we've got now and, and trying to make a nice and funny and visually arresting experience. And this guy's just like, oh, look at the kind of gig everyone's going to be doing in these these days. I know how expensive those bubbles are. No one else is going to be doing gigs like that. Um, but I was surprised at how many people took what he had said at face value. Um, uh, what I don't a, think what a strange I don't think, time we're living in. I don't think accuracy is completely necessary for some of these people. I mean, they will accuracy jump on gets it. in the way. Their search for truth would be spoilt. Truth, truth would be spoilt <laughs> by we live in the post -truth accuracy era where we will not tolerate bubbles. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> no, no bubbles. Moving away. Wayne Coin. He's probably he's the, like the messiah of social distancing by accident. Very prescient. So moving away from that, uh, Peter, you guys have spoken uh, about your um, 
width of influence and the things you've listened to in the past, you know, from your Prince's, your Brian Wilson's and uh, other writers to kind of jazz and classical music that maybe has informed uh, your songwriting and your arrangement decisions. Um, do you feel as though throughout your lifetimes that your gig going experience reflects that? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I would, I mean, I suppose in the end of the day, I really like rock music, <laughs> you know, so I kind of like, that, that, that was the thing that kind of uh, had a like, you know, an awakening um, in in rock. <laughs> That's like a Deep Purple album, isn't it? Um, and, but having said that, some of the best gigs I've ever been to have been jazz gigs or have been sort of classical concerts. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I, would, I mean, I would, I would say in the, the top 10 gigs that or if if there is if i do have such a thing um i would say at least four or five of them were probably not rock or pop shows david same um yeah pretty similar i mean like the our old music teacher who occasionally would just like bump into in the high street in newcastle um, at, you know, long after he had retired, um, he would occasionally convince us to go to um, <laughs> classical concerts. At the, he was a he was a student. At, he was always studying philosophy at the university, and one of the reasons yeah. he was always studying philosophy was because he could get student standby tickets to go and see orchestras play. Um, so he would. <laughs> basically like you know grab us around the ear as if we were back at school oh, if you're gonna go and see if you're gonna go and see what, what was it Rinsey Korsakov he must go and see a, a, a Russian orchestra do it so anyway meet me exactly five past seven on Tuesday and you make sure you bring your student cards and he would he would drag us into these concerts and actually like it's a live music experience being in a relatively small hall with a very loud orchestra in front of you is like one of the most visceral live music experiences you get and and sonically compares very well to being in a big black room with big black speakers pumping out something which is often sonically inferior um and the the power of that probably did affect us quite a lot um although it's Sonically, it's something which is very difficult to to put across um, in in what we do. And I've been been to see loads of great jazz shows, and th there has been a probably a realization that how difficult it is to incorporate those things into like a touring rock band. Um, but we keep trying a little bit, and then and then occasionally we retreat and think, oh, let's just make it slightly easy for ourselves and have a good time because yeah of course the thing which comes across most at any show isn't like the musical intricacies it's the the feeling the enjoyment that comes off stage um and it, it's good to be realistic about that i think and what are your attitude as a band uh, towards uh, arrangement decisions depending on whether you can play it live? Because obviously that's a challenge for every band that has to perform anything live is, you know, um, overproducing and giving yourself a bit, you know, too much to handle when it comes to actually, you know, offering it as a live experience. Peter, have you found that to be something you've had to be conscious of in the past? Um. I think we try to not be conscious of it. So when we um, make a record, we generally don't think about how we're going to play it live until maybe we nearly finished the record and we think, how are we going to play this live? Mm -hmm. And so quite often we'll just drop songs and just don't play them live uh, because we don't have a string quartet in the band. Mm -hmm. Um, 
or we'll do a, we'll try and rearrange it. But we very rarely think of how we're going to play it live when we make the record. I mean, it, it just when we're making a record, I suppose we just whatever the idea is, that's what we go for. Um, and then when we play live, we're just we're we're like then our own. Then we have to band. deal with it. <laughs> yeah. I think that sometimes, though, do you feel as though something David said was that um, the energy and the feeling of a live performance can sometimes replace, you know, can substitute for any level of, um, you know, wild arrangement on record or this incredible sound can, as, you know, live, sometimes even things will get lost in the mix to the point where as long as you've got the core elements of the track, um, on stage and going out to the audience, then that's that's enough. Do you feel sometimes like, you know, it doesn't matter if we've got this really grand synth part because it still sounds good in the room. Is that is is that an answer? Well, it's just, I think, yeah, I think it just depends on how intrinsic it is to the to the thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not a firm believer of a song for it to be a good song has to be able to be played by an acoustic guitar and a, and and a voice. I don't believe that at all. Um, but if we can do it with the band, then and figure out a way of doing it, and for it to come across, then we'll then we'll generally do it. Um, <clears throat> but you know, sometimes, like you said, you can substitute grand arrangements for something else. But sometimes it can be a poor substitute, mm -hmm. and we just have to make that decision on a case by case basis. I think. Yeah, it's different for different songs. Sometimes the the particular arrangement weirdness is like is the fundamental part of the song. With other things, where you can um, trim it down, um, I think we're probably more precious about what it's supposed to sound like, what the arrangement's supposed to be, than our audiences are. Um, we usually find a way to do things. But, I mean, we're at the point now where we've got so many albums and so many songs. Um, it's it's a shame that we've got... Mommy? We just know. drop the hard ones. We just drop all the hard songs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's a shame that we've probably got this stock of about... 30 or 40 songs which have either never been played or only been played once or you know less than five times when we realize that actually this is incredibly inconvenient um but you know that's that's what our career is i think and most of the bands that we listen to most of the bands that we really really love we have never seen live will never see live our relationship with them is entirely through the records for plenty of people who like our band, their relationship with us will mostly be through the records. They won't notice or care that um, whichever tracks have never been played live. Um, we, when, we've just been clearing out my, my dad's house. He's, he's moving house and we have this book called Led Zeppelin, a celebration, which we got when we were kids. And it had a list of like every gig they ever did, every song they ever played at every gig. Um, now, of course, we never went to see Led Zeppelin because they finished in 1980 and I was born in 1980 it's, and we didn't go to Nebworth in I didn't go to Nebworth in my pram. Um, and it turns out that like all of my favorite songs of theirs, they never even played live. Never. They still played plenty of blues covers at their gigs, but they just they didn't. Play That's what we should do. Blues covers at the gigs. Yeah. And just let the records... Put, put put 18 guitar parts on the records. <laughs> now that's definitely a different experience people signed up for. Um, have you found that as your careers have developed that your attitude towards watching other people play live has become a bit of a busman's holiday or is that not something new that has happened to you? I can't remember um, what, what it was like to go to gigs before the kids were born. They've affected it more than being in a band. I mean, yeah, you haven't been to many gigs. I mean, I still like the experience of going to a a room that's half full with a pint and going to see a band and just standing there on my own, 
sipping a nice, I don't know, star prominent or German lager and just enjoying a good rock band, <laughs> you know, in a sort of hundred capacity room, but with not hundred people in. That's my ideal gig. And, and normally a band that I don't, I don't know who it is. Yeah. It feels like... And just my... seeing them play for like five songs. Yeah. And just, do I like this band or not? Yeah, I'll stay. Or no, I'm off. It feels like, like there are some cities in the world where that is just the perfect thing to do. Have you guys, speaking of your enthusiasm for jazz, um, have you guys been to New Orleans? Only when we were, I was too young to to appreciate what was going on, really. But um, yeah, there was. I was so overwhelmed by the uh, spring break vibes of the mm -hmm. other people there mm -hmm. that I didn't necessarily get to enjoy the music that was coming out of like every doorway. I mean, I suppose we had a s similar experiences actually the first couple of times we went to South by Southwest in Austin. Yeah. Um, with slightly less spring breaky vibes, um, and we Only went slightly. to slightly. We went to Beale Street in Memphis, actually, um, and that was another good one. It's like there's just like a really, really, really good blues band playing on this street corner, and we managed to get tickets for Rufus Thomas's 80th birthday celebration concert where bb king played and sam phillips was walked out on the stage to say hello with his two of his children he looked exactly the same as him so it was a strange but um very good experience uh yeah. but yeah that like music as like a fundamental part of society is, is really strong in those cities well, it, and even if it's become like quite touristy it's very much like embraced as a a central part of the, the local psyche there, isn't it? Yeah, I definitely found that in Austin, uh, like you said, but I didn't go to South by Southwest. But New Orleans just feels like, like you said, it's just something that's ingrained into their uh, way of living. And maybe if you do avoid the Bourbon Street, there's a, there's a place called Frenchman Street where you'll go into the 75th most popular bar or cafe or restaurant <laughs> on the street and you'll see better musicians you've ever seen in your life. So yeah, there, there is something about that, like you said, Peter, the um, wandering into a bar with a beer and just going, you know what, this is like, not live music doesn't always need to be something that you plan for a week for, for your Friday night and you wear your favorite yeah. jacket. It's, you, it can just be something where you're like, you know what, this is, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be eventized. It can be, you know what, I'm seeing one of the best bands I've ever seen here. And that can be just as rewarding, can't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. Because you mean, don't have the same expectations, you know, you have a different... You don't, well, you, you don't have any expectations as such. Yeah. Or you have very few. Whereas if you go and say, I'm going to see the Flame and Lips at Ali Pali, then it's like, I'm expecting something here. Yeah. In, in a way, I think to justify the fairly high cost of uh, gig tickets and to justify the most fervent fans, a lot of those like event gigs, um, they, <laughs> they don't work very well for me because they're all too long. And even a band that I really love, I don't think I want to see them play for more than an hour. Like, it, it stops being a fun experience. Saying that, I've never been to see Bruce Springsteen. I, I, I'm, I'm told that he makes the time fly. He does. And we both went to see Prince play at the O2. And he, he definitely played for more than an hour. And it was all great. Um, but with almost everything else I've bought fairly expensive tickets for... Um, the length of the shows was too much for me. Yeah, so I think the clickbait um, that I'm going to use for this interview is going to be uh, exclusive um, field music now cafe house band in Sunderland. Um, that, that, that's what we're going to go for. Um, we'll do it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any um, live recordings that you guys revisit? I'll start with Peter. Um, 
you know, say for example, a gig that you thought, you know, that song was particularly brilliant in that performance when I heard a live recording. Is there anything you return to, video or audio? Um, yeah, lo like loads of stuff. Um, I think my first real experience of Richard Thompson was um, a, a VHS of a, of a TV performance. And then I got, um, yeah, Dave, you bought me a Richard Thompson and Linda Thompson at the BBC. So, um, I re yeah, and then I got, I got something else as well. I got another Richard Thompson live at Rock Palast. And there's something about Richard Thompson's guitar playing live, which is much, and the band themselves, it's, mu it's, it's much wilder. It's really wild. It's, it, starts, it starts creeping into sort of Jimi Hendrix territory. And, and I really like that. It's like, it's almost like on record. I mean, it's still brilliant, but it becomes like a, everything's just, I don't, I, I don't want to like dismiss it because it's, but it's perfect for the record. It's tasteful mm -hmm. and it has taste and it has measure, you know, everything's measured wonderfully played wonderfully recorded and then live it's wild and i really i really like that david any the, standouts almost to the point of preferring sorry we've got you on a slight delay peter so i'm not i promise you i'm not being rude here um but david any any live recordings that stand out to you the one that I that I occasionally go back to, um, and I'm, I don't think it was ever released, but um, so uh, in the early days of the Future Heads, um, you know, Peter played drums in the Future Heads originally, and then they started to tour like more, and it might it wouldn't have made sense for Peter to be doing his band and the Future Heads at the same time because it was clear that the Future Heads were going to be like. A, a proper touring proposition and we were going to make weird art music in our studio um but there there was an excuse me <laughs> I'm still they, always come in, they always come in just as i start to speak <laughs> um I've got a recording of the Future Heads playing in Camden um, before their first album was released. So it's a, a mishmash of songs that were on their early demos and early EPs and some of the stuff that ended up on their B-sides and a little bit of what was on their first album all played in the most frantic style. Um, and it's probably like a better summation of the early future heads that I was, mo that I was really excited about um, than anything they, they put on record because you know their, their record was properly produced in a way which could be successful this live recording was not it was them shouting at each other and counting in different songs at the same time and basically playing it sounded like they were playing four different songs at the same time um, <laughs> and I feel so glad that I have that recording occasionally just to like marvel at the wild tempo changes, some deliberate and some not. And uh, that even though it's not like, it's not pristine, it's not perfectly played or anything like that, but as a concept, it, it's really perfect. Awesome. It kind of captures that raw live energy. Raw live energy silly cheeky belligerent characters um um and yeah uh even um, even more belligerent than my children <laughs> okay so what i'm gonna do now i and i asked two questions of every guest um in a kind of more of a quick fire uh, fashion so no deliberation um, and you can say no comment 
but Peter, favourite show you've ever seen from an audience point of view of all time? Um, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Prince. Prince at the O2. David? Prince at the O2. Love that. And Peter, the last brilliant thing that you saw? Live? Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> God. Um, can't remember. Yeah, probably, probably um, Slug. Okay. Another band that I got kicked out of for being too busy. <laughs> I thought you were going to say for belligerence on the same theme. Not me, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm the least belligerent person out of all the bands that I'm in. <laughs> okay, David, the last great thing that you saw. Oh, God, I can't remember. Um, I can't, I mean, it's been so long since I've seen a gig. I, I, I can't even remember what I've seen. Um, outside of like bands who've come on tour with us. Um, the last tour we did with a support band, um, Mary Epworth played with us, I think. Um, and some of her shows, especially where they were, seemed to be dressed head to toe in glitter, mm -hmm. were particularly fun. So either that or actually going to see the revolution at Shepherd's Bush Empire, which was so heartwarming and even though that it was like longer than my stamina for gigs can last um i might have shed a tear or two that seems like a really great note to wrap it up uh, i reckon thank you very much for tuning into hand stamp hit subscribe like rate and review wherever you get your podcast uh, depending on where you're consuming this. It could be YouTube, could be your favorite podcast platform, who knows? And I'll be back soon with more content. Uh, David Peter, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Thanks for having us.